All right, okay, I can now see why so many of you have been excited for me to get to this arc. This is without question the strongest arc of Hunter x Hunter and one that left me with my jaw on the floor a number of times. Every series has their iconic moments. Dragon Ball had Goku versus Frieza, One Piece has Shabao the Archipelago, and Hunter x Hunter, I now realize, has this. In this video, the material I'll be covering is both thoughtfully composed to highlight the series' greatest strengths, while also single-handedly executing upon long built up previously established plot points and overarching themes, creating something unlike anything I've ever seen from a manga, producing character writing that feels so incredibly brutal and honest that I honestly couldn't help but shed a tear for all those involved. And this is only the first 33 or so chapters. However, while this arc gripped me like none other before it, it also feels filled me with tremendous sadness the moment I began my journey through its opening pages. And I'm not talking about the story. This is an arc I'm sure you've all been waiting for me to cover and I am so thrilled to say that thus far, I've loved it. So let's dive headfirst into this creepy, unsettling and existential nightmare that is Hunter Hunter's Chimera and Ark. If it's okay with you guys, I sort of want to kick off this video with a somber and rather serious subject. As I have already mentioned in the opening, this week's material brought to light something that deeply saddened me. In part due to the pervasive despair that coats the pages of its narrative, but also due to one undeniable issue lingering in the background of indeed this arc and the entire series. Yoshihiro Togashi's dwindling health and output. Something you may have noticed in my videos is that I haven't drawn attention to or outlined a single one of Hunter x Hunter's most commonly known issues. Its seemingly never-ending string of increasingly long hiatuses, the bad art that accompanies it on occasion, and even the vitriolic or disparaging comments the wider anime community lobs Hunter x Hunter's and sometimes even Togashi's way because of them. For the purposes of this video, I was required to read volumes 18 to 21 of the manga written and illustrated by Togashi himself. From as early as volume 1, it became tradition for Togashi to address his audience with either a joke of some description or some important news from his life in these volumes opening pages. In prior volumes, these segments have been a way for Togashi to communicate with us about a fun holiday he recently returned from, it acted as a place for him to announce his marriage to the woman he loves, and even the birth of their first child together. It's all been positive and normally this is something I look forward to reading before I've opened any of the volumes throughout my read-through. However, when I opened these specific volumes, the messages from Togashi painted a very different and very sad picture. Volume 18. I had to redraw a lot of this volume too. Volume 19. This volume was even more work. Volume 20. With volume 21 reading like a plea for help, or at the very least, understanding. I'm just barely getting by. For those of you that aren't aware of this, up until the beginning of the Chimera Ants arc, Hunter x Hunter, while missing certain weeks here and there, was predominantly a consistent weekly series in Shonen Jump like any other. Its art, with very few exceptions, was pristine, regardless of whether you were reading the original magazine publication weekly or the compiled volume later. However, as Tagashi waded into the Chimera Ants arc, the breaks between releases became larger and larger due to serious health complications Tagashi suffered with. This resulted in the majority of the chapters hitting Weekly Shonen Jump in an entirely unfinished state. Sketches, missing panels, descriptive dialogue in place of art. These unfinished pages have spread all over the internet and have severely misled fans about what the Hunter x Hunter manga actually looks like. When I began this series, I was flooded with messages from people attempting to dissuade me from reading the manga as my primary source, entirely based on the idea that these unfinished pages represent what the manga has to offer. Offer. But the thing is, I'm reading the collected volumes of this series and with each new release, Tagashi has gone back over and redrawn or touched up all of the unfinished chapters. Despite his chronic health conditions, Tagashi took the time to finish or redraw 
all of them, and they look absolutely amazing. It's a meme on this channel to say things are the best yet, but the content in these finished volumes is genuinely some of his absolute best work, and not even remotely in the realm of novel or scribbles. Over my career as a review channel, whenever I began a new story, there were always those that would disparage me from choosing to read the manga over the anime. Every community has its own challenges, but in the case of Hunter Hunters, it was the widespread misinformation concerning Hunter Hunter's manga. I received hundreds of posts showing me the bad artwork and citing that as a reason to not read the manga primarily, and yet now, having arrived at the quote, bad bits, over halfway through the series, I found that not only have I never encountered a single bad or unfinished product, but it's also been stunningly beautiful. I'm well aware that I'm not 100% up to date yet, and if I get there and find that there are legitimate issues, I will acknowledge and talk about them, but thus far, over 20 volumes deep, the rhetoric that Hunter Hunter's manga is ugly or lacking in any way is a misguided exaggeration that flies in the face of Tagashi's hard work. Now, I'm not going to drone on any further, instead I will let Togashi's work speak for itself throughout this video. Oh yeah, by the way, did I mention that the beginning of this arc is incredibly weird and sort of cheesy? As mentioned above, the arc is filled with really interesting and beautiful imagery, yes, and while the start of this arc is no different, it is set apart almost immediately from the other arcs in this series. Between every story so far, the Hunter Exams, the Vulcan Family arc, the Heaven's Arena arc, the York New and Greed Island arcs, Hunter Hunter has almost made it its life's mission to tie every single arc seamlessly together, allowing for the story to naturally flow into the next. However, the Chimera Ant arc does not do this. Or at least it doesn't as much as the others, and as a result of that, for the first few chapters of this arc, I was really worried that this highly praised arc was going to be disappointing. Spoilers, it wasn't. Largely, the beginning portion of the story looks as though it was shot like one of those cheesy old-timey monster movies from the 30s and 40s, complete with authentic giant chimera and bug monster. One of the biggest revelations at this time was that of this character, the chimera and monster. While unique, it didn't strike me initially as being designed to emote in any meaningful way, and if I'm being honest, unlike the driving forces behind many of the prior arcs, we didn't have a tie to this arc's antagonist in any meaningful way, or at least not in a way that we were aware of, which I think largely contributed to this arc's slow start for me predominantly. But that's not even to say that its weakest part didn't have amazing and touching moments. Establishing a character's defining actions like a young boy trying to defend his little sister from this chimera ant monster helped to establish the antagonistic force of the story as well as set the tone for the coming conflict. Now, this introduction was fine, but compared to the other arcs, it felt lukewarm, and the last thing I wanted was to watch a story waste Kite's reintroduction to the series, seeing how hyped I was having just finished Greed Island. And for those of you who haven't seen or read this arc, in short, it might sound like the antagonistic and protagonistic forces have nothing to do with each other, and in a way, you're right. Gun and Killua are just after teaming up with Kite and his crew as they engage in ecological activity, all the while on the other side of the world, the Chimera and Queen slowly begins to kill animals and eventually people, trying to grow her family with the goal of one day in the not so distant future of giving birth to the Chimera and King. And that's the beginning of this arc in a nutshell, really. One plotline that, while cute, doesn't have any particular direction, and another that feels like a run-of-the-mill monster movie. Both fine, yes, but not at all connected. However, that doesn't last, and what comes next is the absolute best or most raw material I've yet seen produced by Hunter Hunter. This is where the business of the story kicks off, and boy, does it never stop. The action in this portion of the story is the strongest in the entire series, and I'm speaking from a manga perspective here. People can give the initially released sketches all the grief they want in the world, but at the end of the day, the finished manga speaks for itself, because once Kite and the team are enlisted into the NGL zone to investigate the infestation of Chimera Ants, the scenarios and encounters they experience, the deeper they go into the sinister wilderness, the more visually stunning the manga looks, and the more intense the story becomes. There's honestly a terrific horror element to this story 
spirit that while it began in a much less refined or savory way, evolved much like the monsters themselves into a more sophisticated product. I'm always thrilled when a manga can do something creative with its paneling and Togashi employed a simple but brilliant choice to kill his battle in the forest of the NGL zone alongside Kite and Gon. After being stung by this scorpion chimera, there's a moment where we think Killua could conceivably be in trouble. There's some quick panels to establish her point of view and then... This legitimately got me. I was so taken aback by how Togashi perfectly played with my anticipation to achieve what he did here. Regular or standard paneling is fine, but this is such a great and thoughtful use of the manga medium that helped drag me into this story all the more. And fittingly, this plays into the greater mission of this portion of the narrative, to tell a heart-wrenching and compelling story centered around Gon and Killua. And thankfully, this is helped in part by the surprisingly warm and engaging character of Kite. Personally, at the beginning of this, I was very worried that he would fall to the wayside and feel like a one-no character, but Tagashi made sure to add plenty of depth and texture to his character. Whether it be through his position as a mentor to the two boys, our peeks into his mind as he thinks about how amazing they really are, and we even see that he has some comedic elements that didn't contradict or come at the cost of any of his more serious traits. Additionally, and this is where the scene impressed me the most early on, it made full use of Kite's character in the same breath as the Chimera ants. So something I've neglected to mention thus far was how much characterization and time Togashi granted these dangerous monsters to humanity. So much so that through the process of getting to know them, I actually started to respect and like some of the ants, with one character in particular acting as a great gray area for us. Not necessarily due to what he does or what he says, but where we know those words are coming from. This is clearly a chimera ant that possesses the mentality or personality of that protective older brother killed in the previous scenes and as this ant is contrasted with the rest of the chimeras he's in company with, that otherwise were made up of criminals that met a similar fate, it helps to highlight thematically a rather strong message of this arc. It's not what they look like that defines who they are, it's what they do with that power. And given what later happens in this arc, I'm wondering what sort of mirror this philosophy will hold up to the main cast if they are forced to act upon morally ambiguous impulses. And now, with both sides of the conflict thoroughly explored with their nuances expressed, we are greeted by one of the most surprising and shocking scenes I've ever read in my life. I've spoken from the beginning of this story, expressing my impressions of Gon's mindset and the contrast he creates with Killua. That they are both two extreme ends of what could ultimately be the same sort of person. Gon being one to throw caution to the wind and to always give everything he has, no matter what. And Killua, someone that when forced with an unsure situation, runs. And in this scene, this dynamic is on display side by side for all to see. As the three of them venture deeper and deeper into the forest in search of the nest, hopefully in an effort to eliminate these ants, Kite, Killua, and Gon are stopped in their tracks as Kite senses an approaching enemy. On top of this proving to be a terrific crescendo to the ever-building tension over the last while, it also made me leap from my seat in excitement as every single atom of this encounter was informed by character. Kite's mentor role, Pito's determination to seek out those with Nen, Gon's readiness to fight despite what Kite said, and Killua's immediately knocking out of his best friend for his own safety. I mentioned in my Attack on Titan video momentarily that one of the best attributes different scenes can offer is the question without an answer. If all your characters behave and act rationally without any flaws and never make any mistakes, then you have a boring scene. There's no texture there. There's no interest. However, when you add that uncertainty to a scenario, you get a scene riddled with what ifs. What if Killua chose to stay? What if Gon managed to avoid Killua's attack? What if Kite got a better weapon? What if, what if, what? if. This was the chapter I had to take a break for and during the break my mind was left spinning trying to determine who in fact was in the right here. Hunter x Hunter has gone out of its way to almost parody in every opportunity the shonen genre as a whole and in this scene the most shonen event took place but the heroes retreated and we weren't certain if that was the right decision, highlighting once more Killua and Gon's greatest flaws which just so happened to be what this arc is about. Additionally, something else which I think is noteworthy has to be Kite's demise here and now. In the manga, this is a massive subversion, both for Gon and us as the readers. Introduced to him in the first chapter, while this is a reunion of sorts, Kite primarily is someone that set the foundation for the Gon character we see today. And when we see him get torn away from us, we're 
left speechless. Surely this couldn't have happened just like this, not after all this time we've waited to see him. Surely he could still be alive and well, and while riding that wave of hope, Tagashi takes full advantage of our perspective by placing some truly horrific imagery of Kite's disembodied head on the lap of Pito. And while I mentioned this briefly last week, I do think it's worth mentioning one more time in this instance. The 2011 anime omitted this scene and as a result robbed it of the weight the manga otherwise gave it by design. In the manga, he's one of the first characters we're introduced to, he helps to inform who Gon eventually becomes, and the reunion we get to enjoy between the two characters is bitterly brief. But in the anime, he just, for all intents and purposes, despite the retroactive integration, is very much a new character that shows up to just die. The exhaustion Killua exhibits from carrying Gon's unconscious limp carcass all the way back to the entrance shows just how fast and hard he tried to get out of there. This kid was terrified. All the training they went through, all that they've overcome throughout this story. Seeing that look on Killua's face and the exhaustion he felt after simply running really puts into perspective the mindset he was in, as well as helps to amplify my intimidation towards these new antagonists all the more. This is incredibly effective and potent storytelling. And with my mind now fixated on Killua, thinking back to his quitting of the ball game against Natero in the first arc, we... Jeez, speak of the devil, it's Natero! Your boy got sponsored by G Fuel! Dude, that's awesome! <laughs> like, this is a huge deal, and they sent me tons of creative flavors. I mean, do you want to try some? Yeah, totally. What kind of flavors did they give you? Well, they've got strawberry lemonade, some Ooh, dragon fruit, some rainbow sherbet. Wait, what? How about some PewDiePie? Okay, that's just a guy. Some Bahama Mama. What's that even supposed to taste like? Lotion? Dude, seriously, like, this is a really big deal for me. I mean, like, if I don't do a good job with the sponsorship, the G Fuel monster might come. What's the G Fuel monster? This, uh, the stories surrounding G Fuel are as old as they are terrifying. Everyone seems to be convinced that she feels some zero-sugar, caffeine-free alternative to other energy drinks on the market. But in reality, this substance mined deep within the Earth's core comes with a deep and sinister curse. Well, a c curse? Why, yes. My dear boy, if you never really stop to consider what the G in g actually stands for, do you get me? <laughs> Ghosts. Initially, I worried over this section possibly feeling like another waiting period, however, upon closer inspection, it precisely focuses on some of the most interesting and fleshed out elements of this entire series, the two boys. While the Chimera Ants are the titular antagonists, they are very much there to facilitate these moments of character reflection in this tale. Without them, without this unknown powerful force shrouded in mystery, unaware of where they exactly are, how many there are, or whether or not Kite will ever return, it preys with surgical precision on the issues Gon and Killua face personally. <laughs> Moyori no machi ni futari, shikaku wo hanatta. 
This scene was viciously interesting. Netero, someone that once upon a time would only speak lightheartedly and with positive vibes over different subject matter, is firm in this scene. Once again, aiding in the effort to create a sense of unease and chaos around the situation, implying perhaps covertly that he may very well think that Gon and Killua are valuable, but in Killua's case, he sees serious issue. One that has been a recurring theme with Killua since the very beginning of this series, his lack of tenacity. 100% I think what I found most interesting when reading Natero's analysis of this situation wasn't what he said, but what he didn't say. And ultimately, my wondering over why he never said it. And that specifically concerns Gon and his shortcomings. Natero, throughout this exchange, seemed to fixate exclusively on Killua's issues, and this is the brilliance of this scene. Killua very much does have issues, and I think they are much more pronounced and therefore clearer to others when he engages with people. However, Gon, seemingly suicidal disregard for himself and, under the right circumstances, others around him have played a significant role in this series too, from as early as the first arc. But all of those instances or shortcomings seem to be much more close linked to tenacity or perhaps more dangerously can masquerade as tenacity and so the latter makes me wonder does Natero know of that poison in Gon he's coaching Killua and does make clear his flaws and while what he says is interesting and worth thinking about for Killua I think it's what he doesn't say to Gon that made the most noise in my mind if even Natero isn't aware of it or doesn't consider it a pressing issue is Natero's direction focused on the right someone for right as he finishes out in Killua's issue issues and the two boys are sent on their way to overcome the set of tests in the next town, we smash cut to an image of Kite's decapitated head resting on Pito's lap. And it did that all to possibly subvert the message or instruction Natero outlined, to prove the point that Gon could also be nuts and that Killua made the exact right call in that moment considering Natero didn't know the scale of the situation. Which, again, plays into that very philosophy I adore in writing offered by Pete Docter from Pixar. It's that struggle with no answer that makes for the best stories. And that quote is pertinent because, as an audience, we have perhaps the best insight into this encounter. And I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem nearly as clean-cut as Natero is making it out to be. Killua does have this issue in him for certain, but perhaps, in this instance, he did the right thing. Jeez, I, I love this story. It's so complicated and it's so detailed. It's so nuanced and I it's amazing. <laughs> Alright, so this section of the story we're about to embark upon is set up to once again be a very stereotypical shonen subplot, wherein the two main characters offer themselves over to a wonderful master, in this case Biscuit, in order to overcome the challenge of collecting their opponent's tiles, so as to qualify to help with the Chimera and problem before the king is born, and in case Natero and the other more advanced hunters need assistance. And before Pam cuts them into little pieces. This could very well be the most unshonen training arc I think I've ever seen. The boys are made to understand their circumstances, understand what's at stake, what they need to do, and then they fail. Hard. And I'm here for it. I love that decision. In this training section, the two boys fail in their assignment, but in doing so, I think they learn the exact lessons they needed to. Or at least one of them does. And interestingly, despite the vast majority of hiccups, they come out on top in the end. Oh, well, okay. Not really, but it's okay, sort of, but... Alright, let's take a look at this because it might be the highlight of the arc for me so far. Once we get to this town, the two boys must train and we're immediately introduced to this charming character called Pam. She she is depicted in just whew, the most horrific way. Like, she looks like what would happen if you combine Sally from The Nightmare Before Christmas with a Dementor from Harry Potter. Her bloodthirsty eagerness to participate in this effort with Natero is honestly hilarious. Her straightforward, brutal honesty in the face of the boy's lack of development or progress really leads her to deliver some of the most dry and hilarious threats on their lives, contrasted beautifully with Gon's kind-hearted and oblivious nature. In the manga, so many of her shots depict her with this wild jet black hair totally obscuring her face with the only visible discerning feature being her piercing white eyes that cut through the darkness like a wild animal caught in the headlights. I'm not entirely sure what sort of role this character will play in the long run, but at the moment she's here to act as a threat as I said to the two boys if they fail, but primarily also a comedic one. Oh, 
And uh, Biscuit's here. The two boys at this moment in time are like chaos and order side by side. Too much chaos is utterly ineffective and too much order meets pretty much the same fate. But honestly, Killua gets put on blast in this section quite a bit more than Gon does. In fact, a great scene takes place where even Biscuit takes Killua to task and tells him that either he overcomes this issue he seems to have trouble with or he must leave Gon's side immediately. The stakes are high for sure, but even then I couldn't help but think, why is no one taking Gon to task about his issue nearly as harshly? And then this happens. So, all the while we are watching the boys slowly progress and try to perfect their nen in order to overcome their targets, knuckle and shoot, we have the stakes get worse and worse and worse elsewhere. And interestingly, this is where this side of the conflict starts to come into its own. For the longest time, this section was just about the emotionless queen making babies and her offspring running amok gathering more resources, but this time, the king is here. Alright, so, uh, I get the feeling this is a long-running and exhausted joke, but I'm gonna say it anyway. This king guy is such a rip-off design-wise of Cell and Frieza from Dragon Ball. But hey, uh... At least it's scary. Furthermore, with a now defected ant letting the Natero know that he has no chance against this new king, the hype levels rise even further. Plus, Natero powering up is friggin' awesome. With all of these different elements and interactions, all of this is starting to feel a lot more like Dragon Ball, and I'm here for it. Alright, so look, this is the last day that Golden Killua can fight them and qualify to help Natero in his effort with the Chimera Ants. They've gotten a ton stronger in the last month, and now it is go time. And the battle Gon has with Knuckles is phenomenal, one that depends on your knowledge and expectation to deliver its message. Obviously, Knuckle is an endearing character, and I do love him, but I also love the mechanics of Knuckles' Nen, which force Gon to be strategic and efficient with his movements. He oh, can't no. rush in. It's a great pairing in combat. Killua's fight with Shoot, on the other hand, who forces him to be more direct and confident in his movements is also great. That fight in particular has some sublime paneling that captures the frantic, stressed out and disorganized nature of the encounter. Perfectly captures the chaotic, cluttered and uncertain thoughts of Killua as he tries to make sense of everything that's going on. It's unlike any fight in the series and stands out all the more because of that fact. As it should, this is a pivotal moment for the young one-time assassin turned hunter to prove to both his mentor and to himself that he is his own person and that he is in control of his life and decisions not anyone else. And they lose. Gon now has no Nen for a month due to the after effects of Knuckles' Nen, and Killua, in his own mind, knows that he must protect Gon, ironically, while he's defenseless and then leave him forever. This was such a remarkable place to leave this story, such a low point, and it's brilliant. Gon and Killua did face off against their respective targets, but they did so while showing that they both still have the same problems. Gon went headfirst into the battle with Knuckle time and again, and while it proved to be great training, it was the same straightforward and unflinching approach which proved to be his downfall in the last encounter before he was ultimately defeated. And Killua, while he did eventually face him, he did so at the last possible moment. Which means these decisions these two kids made throughout this mini arc could have been indicators for its ending to us as an audience. If we were paying attention, we could have seen this coming. This is such a brilliant section of the story. And then there's... Uh, well... This character, despite lacking I assume any higher soul, is very much the heart and soul of this arc section. She is so damn funny in this manga. But again, there's this weird 22 year old girl now being pacified with a possible date and relationship with a 13 year old boy in Gone, who happens to be, by the way, a real ladies man and I don't know how to feel about that. But it does help to facilitate one of the best Killua moments in the entire series. The fight against this random chimera ant he encounters pushes Killua more than I think any moment in the series has pushed him. He is petrified, shaking and seemingly not at all emotionally prepared for this encounter. And I love this scene for a multitude of reasons, but primarily I love it because the very love Killua has for his best friend in the world was what made him approach this enemy without any intel or preparation. And the shot of him shaking and crying honestly hit me like none other in this arc. But it's that history that they shared which allowed him to overcome this serious issue he had. I'm not sure yet what the transmitter in his brain's knock-on effects might be for the series or his brother or how he will react, but but right now, Killua is an absolute monster. 
This is going to be fun. And okay, I know I hate to leave it here and break these arcs up like I have been, but with this one specifically, there's just too much to cover in this review alone. So next week, I'll be back to continue this exceptional arc. And while I don't know what's still to come, I do know I am supremely excited to share my thoughts on it with you all next week. See you everyone. And thank you all so much for watching.